the conference. All right, so I think, okay, so for some reason the live stream cut out, but then I'm not going to post the key because I want you to look up the notes. I want you to try to get the answers yourself. Uh, I did write stuff down. I mean, I, I knew that. I mean, that's pretty typical um, for, for exams. If there is something that you just, you just don't understand why, why it is, or don't understand how to actually calculate some of these things, then we can we can address that. We we can you can ask the questions. And we can cover that as a class. All right. Uh, I want you to use this as kind of a, a guide for next Monday's uh, retry. We'll call that a retry, do over, and we'll we'll see we'll see what we do. Uh, again, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just replace, I'll take whatever the highest grade is for the part one, and I'll scale it to 50 points, so that way we're out of, uh, it, it remains the same, because I don't know how many points it'll be. Uh, part two is already posted, uh, it's in your grades, uh, you should be able to see, like, if you click on it, you should be able to see the, you know, what you lost, you know, what questions you lost, you should see the comments, um, if we look at the quizzes and exam sections. Uh, I have the application already posted as a PDF. Uh, I did point out a couple things. Some common ones were uh, this one, 1B. 18 or more is you can have 18 or 19 or 20 out of 20. So you can do it. Just do D of 18, D binome of 18, D binome of 19, D binome of 20, and add them up. Uh, or you could do like a sum of the D binome C of like 18 to 20. Uh, or I actually use this. I add this in here as well, the P binome, because we're getting ready to use, I mean, we use P norm, uh, but we're getting ready to use this as like probably for, uh, to calculate P values. So I added some more details. Same thing applies to 2B. Uh, some of you were, were pretty close because I asked one or more day, and you recognize it could it be on one day or two days or three days or four days, but I think only one of you actually caught that the Poisson is infinite. So if you did one to seven, you're still missing a very small probability, which is eight or more. So the easier way is just to calculate the zero and then do one minus that. Uh, whoever did like zero to 500, I, I gave you credit because you basically hit the rounding capability of the computer. Uh, so it worked and, and I understand that that's what, that's what we're doing. Those are the most common ones that, that were missed. Uh, confidence intervals, uh, pay attention to true or false. And this was also somewhat that was common. So. You did this incorrectly, so you do like p norm lower dot tail equals t, and then you do the p norm of the negative 2.51 equals false. But then on the very next question where you had, you specify the mean and standard deviation, is this one? You did it correctly. You, know, you had the t or you did the false. It depends on which which way you were going. So take a look at those. Uh, you'll definitely see these things on the final exam. Check it out if you have questions. Uh, feel free to ask. Feel free to ask. All right. All right. So I also put this here. Lecture presentations. I have this test summary students. I'll open this up because uh, it's not, I'm not happy with the exact formatting, but I wanted to get it out to you so you can do this. The idea is to have one page per test. All right. The idea is to have one page per test, and that represents our summary. So you're going to have like the test name, you know, what test did we learn? You're going to have the number and the type of the variables that, that we use or that are applicable for that test because, as I said, the number and type help determine what types of tests are available to us. Uh, the assumptions of the test, you know, might be one assumption, might be two, three, maybe four assumptions. And then we're null, we'll have our null hypothesis, alternate hypothesis, test statistic, degrees of freedom, all right? And then 
you have the R code, which is like the generic function, like how I did uh, the P norm, and I did the fact, you know, F, P norm of X and then mean standard deviation. That's our generic function, and then the description of like, okay, for X, that's our value. For mean, it's going to be the mean of the vector, or mean of the distribution, or, or whatever. And, and we'll do this. Uh, I'll have you attempt it as we start getting these first couple tests, and then we'll check what I would what I would have filled out that we can kind of match up. And then the example, yep. Can you take a picture of this? Or... It's posted. Okay. It's posted right here underneath the lecture presentations. I put it right at the top. Um, so you can download it as a Word doc, and then you can kind of fill it out. And then if you wanted to, I guess, copy and paste it down at the bottom. Um, again, still not happy. I, I was kind of wondering if I should do more like a table with boxes. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it has uh, all of the, the information. And then I have the example. And the example is going to be, <clears throat> that's up to you to find an example. There's plenty of built-in data sets. You basically would look at some data sets and say what, what could apply to it, what types of data sets would, would apply to it. Maybe you find one off the internet or maybe you, you create one yourself. All right. The idea is that you're going to have a data set, you're going to ask a question, that's our basic uh, question. Are the means equal? Are roach you know, wing lengths equal between the buildings? That's our basic question. And then you're going to actually have the R code that runs the command with the output and that gives you then the ability to do your write-up, all right? And at this point, we don't have to worry about checking the assumptions. We will. I mean, that's some of our tests will be tests that we use to check our assumptions. Uh, but I have this posted so that you, we can use it. And then we will kind of review it. Uh, and later on in the class, as we get through a series of tests, what we'll start doing is assembling like a flow chart that says, okay, we have one variable. Maybe it's a continuous variable. These are the tests that, that are available to us. And if we want to test the mean, this is what we have. If we want, want to test the variance, this is the test that we have. So we kind of get a flow chart of, of what tests to use when. And then these handouts are, OK, this is the test I want to use. How do I do it? Here's our summary. And we'll kind of fill one of those out. All right. So. Remember, with our statistical test, there are five things that we're going to report. Those are going to be things that get reported in our write-up. So, first thing we're going to do, over in my R Studio, is a situation where we have one continuous variable, and we're going to have the test of mean. So, we basically have a continuous variable, and we want to know if our mean is equal to some value. So is our mean equal to some value? Or we could also ask, is one value that we have equal to a population mean? All right, these are, these are the general, general questions. Our two tests that we have to answer these questions is the z-score test, and it's fairly uncommon, and our one sample t-test, which would probably be the, the more common test that we would run. All right. The difference between these comes down to really what type of standard deviation we have. Right. If we have a population standard deviation, we're going to do a z-score test. If we have a sample standard deviation, we're going to use our t-test. The reason for this is that if we have a population standard deviation, it goes back to our equation where if we take our x value and we subtract the mu and divide by sigma, that approximates a normal distribution, right? We did that for, to calculate z. We did that to calculate z. If, however, we don't have a, the population standard deviation, we had to use our sample standard deviation to calculate the standard error. We had to do that. What does that approximate? Any guesses? Remember, that one's our sigma. This one's s over the square root of n, which is our standard error. So what does this approximate? We haven't covered many, many distributions. 
We'll join. Do you think it's a normal distribution? No. That's a normal. What's that? Is a Poisson a continuous distribution? No, that's a discrete. Binomial? Binomial. Is that a continuous distribution? Or a discrete? Discrete. Those are two discrete distributions. T distribution. Oh, T distribution. So T distribution. We use this for our confidence interval. Because we didn't have a sigma. We had an S. So we had to use this. We had to use the T distribution to estimate our confidence interval. So that's where it's coming down to. If we have sigma, we're going to use a Z score test, which is a normal curve. If we have sample standard deviation, we're going to use our T tables because we're doing a T test. All right. So here's two different questions. Uh, one question for each, or a scenario each. So we have a sample of acorns where our sample size is 25, and it has an average length of 15.8 millimeters. All right. Our question, is the average different from the average acorn size of the species? So we go out, we have an unknown tree, we measure their acorns, and we have an average length, and then we look up and, and we say, we think it's this species, and this species has acorn length of, you know, mu and a standard deviation, a sigma of, uh, so mu of 18.7 and a sigma of 2.9. And our question, is this average different from the average acorn of the species? This question is what I would call our biological question. Our statistical question would be that our mean is 15.8 is equal to 18.7. So our means are equal. That's our null hypothesis. Our alternate is that it's not. This is different from a, a teeth test. So we still have the average acorn size for a species of oaks is 18.7. If you collected a sample of acorn uh, that has a mean of 15.8 and a standard deviation of 2.2, then is our sample average smaller than our predicted species of oak? So with our predicted species of oak, we know the length, but we don't know what the population standard deviation is. So we have to approximate it using our sample. That tells us we have to use a teeth test. All right, so both of these questions were a little bit different. One was, are the means equal or are the means different? The other one says, is our mean, is our sample average smaller? And that gets to this idea of doing a one-tail test versus a two-tail test. Which one we choose just kind of depends on our biological question. It depends on how we phrase our question. All right, in the first period we just, or in that first question we asked, does this match the average for this species? All right, we didn't specify direction. We're just interested. Are they equal or not? That suggests a two-tailed test. But in the second question, we phrase it as if to test if our average was smaller than the species. Now we've set a direction, and that means we're going to go for a, a one-tailed test. Now what's the difference? The difference comes into play where we set our alpha. So for both tests, we set our alpha at 0.05 at 5%. That's what we're looking for, 5% type 1 error rate. If we're doing a two-tailed test, we have to account for being larger and being smaller than our mean. So with our two tails, our 5% in the tails is going to occur in both the upper and the lower tail, which means we're basically saying we have 2.5% in the upper tail, 2.5% in the lower tail for a total alpha of 5%. If, however, we set a direction, we still have 5% in the tails, but because we set the direction, we're going to put all of our 5% in one tail. All right? We're going to set it all in one tail. Now, what does this do to our null and alternate hypotheses? Well, the null hypotheses are going to be the same. It's that our values are equal. That's about the only way we can do it. Do it. We're going to set our values equal. We're going to test are they equal or not. It's the alternate hypothesis that, that differs. So for a two-tailed test, we phrase our alternate as that they're not equal. If it's a one-tailed test, we specify our direction. A is larger than B, or A is smaller than B, and so forth. So let's do a Z-score test. All right. 
So we have a sample of acorns. Sample is 25, has an average length, 15.8. Uh, is our average different from the average size? All right, so now we are doing a statistical test. All right, we already learned this part where the average minus mu over sigma approximates a normal distribution. We did this. We did this to calculate our z, and then we use our z table. But now that we're interested in statistical tests, we're interested in the standard error of the mean. That's what we're interested in. All right, standard error of the mean. So instead of just using a sigma, we're going to use the standard error, the population level standard error, which is our sigma over the square root of n. It looks very similar to this, right? It is, but we're using the population value. And again, it's because we're, we're looking at our statistical comparisons. Even though we make that, that transformation, even though we're going to use our population standard error, our transformation still approximates a normal distribution, a normal 0, 1. All right? So with our statistical hypotheses, we're, get, we're testing if the means are equal. But we're going to do so by applying our transformation and seeing if our newly transformed data follow a zero, uh, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. All right, and the question is why? Because there's really no easy way to generate a test statistic with x bar and mu being equal. So in a sense, our test statistic is going to be this value. Is this value, is this z equal to zero or not? That allows us then to say, well, if we know our transformation follows a normal zero, one curve, then we can calculate a z from our sample and say, okay, well, how likely is it that we're going to get a value as extreme or more extreme than this value just by chance alone? Well, where did this chance alone come from? Our near our zero one normal distribution. That's our null distribution. That's what we're comparing against. Just from a random sample, that's what we our histogram should look like. This area, as well as negative z, that area and that area represents our p value. Have we done this? Yeah, we did. We did do it. So let's go through this example. Uh, I think we're going to move up to the board for this. You know, leave this up. Everyone's going to get sick. All right. Doing this problem on homework assignment. So we have a sample of eight. Sample of eight ones. Average length is 15 point. So that's given in the problem. Right. Why did I use x bar? Why did I use x bar? It's our sample. That's all it is. And we're comparing it to a population. Mu is 18.7. Sigma. is that our average equals 
our sample average equals the population average, the x bar equals zero. What's our alternate hypothesis? For this problem, I gave it as they're not. So is this a one tail or a two tail test? One tail or two tail? Two tail. Two tail test. Test this by calculating the z. So if this is true, if our means are equal, then our x bar minus the mu over sigma divided by the square root of n will approximate a normal zero one distribution. Will approximate a normal zero one distribution. So let's calculate z. Z will be this 15.8 minus 18.7 divided by our sigma 2.9 over the square root of 25. That's a standard error of the mean. What do we get? should give us a normal zero one. So we are centered then at zero. And we have a standard deviation of one. Our z observed, which could be an equivalent to a test, is all the way up out here. Negative five. All right. And what we're interested in is our p value. So what's a p value? What's the definition of our p value? Yeah. As extreme or more extreme by chance, if our null hypothesis is true. So if this is true, if our null hypothesis is true, then we should get this curve, and this represents our, our null distribution. What we want to know is we calculate negative 5. How likely is it? that we would get a value as extreme or more extreme, get a value negative 5 or more, more negative, if we actually followed a normal 0, 1 curve. Well, what is that probability? Well, we're working with a continuous distribution. That means we're looking at that area. So our p-value is that probability of getting data more, as extreme or more extreme. So we are looking at probability that our z would be less than or equal to negative 5. But is that the full p-value? No, why not? What's that? It is. But as you treat, we're 5 standard, z is standard deviate, right? That's what it means. So we're 5 standard deviates below the who says we can't be five standard deviates above them? So we can also be there. Now, what do we know about the normal distribution? It's symmetric. So are these things equal? Oh, yeah. So we can do two times the probability of z, I'm going to say greater than or equal to 5, because we have a table that looks at that, at that area. And actually, we don't, because it's off the table. This is a very, very small number. P value. If that's a 
very small number, we multiply it by two, what are we, what are we left with? Another very small number. So we would have a p value that's actually very small, or going off of our rounding rules for the p value, it'll be less than 0 0.0001. Can we do it in R? Can I get this p value in R? Yeah. Let's go ahead and do it. Go ahead. Fire up R. Let's get our p value and see how close we are to that point zero 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 one. What you get? Um, let's go back to here. So I've started my R Markdown document. All right, I've got my data library functions. We haven't made it to there yet. Uh, I can easily go in and copy paste the standard error so it's available. All right, I started with things to report in a write up. All right, just kind of right at the top. And note again, reject null hypothesis is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. We go back to our basic question. All right, so, so our z-score test uh, test if a uh, here. this test checks if a single value or sample mean equals some single value or population. For this test, we know the population standard deviation. All right, and that's going to be key. Let's get this down here. Right, that's going to be key. We know the population standard deviation. And that's because 
our value x minus mu oops, divided by the standard error of the mean, population standard error of the mean. So we'll do uh, sigma divided by square root of n, of our sample n, approximates a normal 0, 1. All right. So our p-value then is is equal to the probability that we would get a z that is greater or equal to our actual x mu is x minus mu over that. There we go. All right, so here's our example. Sample of acorns, 25. We already did it on the board. All right, so I'm going to do z observed because we don't have we don't really have a z z score test built into R. So we're going to have to do this by hand. So I'm going to do the z observed. So what do we know? Well, we know our average length is is 15.8. All right, so it's 15.8. That's our average length, and we have our population, which is 18.7. All right, so 15.8 minus 18.7. And we're going to divide that quantity by our sigma, 2.9, divided by the square root of our sample size. All right, so we're going to have z observed. Then we're going to do our p norm. And the question is, do we use lower dot tail equals t or lower dot tail equals f? How do we know? Well, we're looking for the tail, right? Yep. So. In our case, we are doing p norm of the z, the z observed, z obs, where our mean is equal to 18.7, and our standard deviation equals, what is it? What's our standard deviation? Almost. We need to account for that. It's a standard, standard deviation would be the population standard error of the mean. So we'll account for that sample size here. And then lower dot tail equals t. But we're not done. It's a two-tailed test. All right, so this is, ooh, I get zero. It's crazy. Do you get zero? Yeah, we, we should. This is basically beyond the capabilities. It's very, very small. So let's talk, let's talk about this, okay? So the Z observed uh, is the value that we did up on the board. All right, so that's going to go here in the P norm. All right? The mean is the, uh, the mean that we, we give it is the population mean. Oops. The SD is our population standard error of the mean, which is our sigma over the square root of our sample size. All right, and lower dot tail equals T. You know, why do we do that? We do this because Z obs is negative. How do, I, how do I know that? Well, I didn't know it ahead of time. So what I would have had to do is calculate z obs just to see that it's negative 5. Now, if it's as extreme or more extreme, we're negative 5. We're 5 units below. Our more extreme is going to be even more negative. So that tells me we're going to go to the left of that value. All right, and that's our lower dot tail equals t. All right. 
our 2x value, we do that because it's a two-tailed test. All right, and we, we rely on the fact that this is uh, normally distributed, or that our normal curve is symmetric. Alternate method to avoid figuring out lower dot tail is this. We already have our Z, we're, we'll do this, copy and paste it. We have our Z obs, but this time we don't know if it's plus or minus. So what I can do, since we are symmetric, I'm going to use ABS. ABS of Z obs gives us the absolute value of z obs. It, if it's negative, it returns a positive. If it's positive, it's still a positive. But because of that, then we could just use lower dot tail equals f, which gives us to the right of that value. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives us to the right of that value. So this is kind of like a cheater method where if you just do this all the time, you're going to be good. And this applies even if it's a one-tail test. If it's a one-tail, you do the same thing, but you take out the 2x, or the 2 times, because you don't need the 2 times. And then we just specify lower dot tail equals t. So uh, lower dot tail equals f, because absolute value puts us in the positives. And it doesn't matter. If we're, if we're positive to begin with, we stay positive. Just if we're negative, it gets us back to the positive. Oh, hold on. I messed up here. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I did that. I really did mess, mess up. We did Z observed. All that becomes a one because we converted it ourselves. Um, so the conversion gives, a, gives us Gives us the mean of zero, and this conversion gives a SE of one, and then that means get those mean and standard deviation. There we go. It's small. Gives us some number. This allows us to do it by match what we do by hand. Why did I do it the other way? What? <laughs> yeah. So, do we need to calculate Z observed? Do we need to do that? I was looking ahead just to see if I had another example. Put up here. Do we need to calculate Z observed? So this method kind of follows what I did up on the board. That's how we do it up on the board. We use our Z tables to answer those questions. Are we going to do this actually by hand? No, we're going to use R to do this. So do we need to calculate Z observed? What do you think? Do we? We did this transformation to get us to a zero one. 
right? So that we could use a normal table. This, can we bypass that Z and let R do it for us? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was already thinking ahead. Yeah. No, so yeah. No, we don't have to. We can let R do it for us. So in this case, we don't need Z obs. We'll still do our two times because we're two two sided. But in this case, we do our te we're testing 15.8. That's our value that we're testing, and we're testing against a normal distribution that has a mean of 18.7 and a standard deviation of 2.9 divided by the square root of 25. All right, I'm gonna run this. We should get the same number. So this runs, our lower dot tail is T, it stays that same. And the reason why we know it's a T is because 15.8 is less than 18.7. So because of that, because we're testing a mean that's less than our population, we're going to go to the left. If our test value is greater than the mean, then we, we would use lower dot tail equals F, or lower dot tail equals F, false. We're gonna go to the right. So if our test value is greater than, than mu, then we use lower dot tail equals F. Let's check. Oops, sorry. Right up. All right. So we've got those five things to report. All right. We technically don't have a, a test statistic with this. All right. But in terms of our write up, we would report our sample mean because that's what we're, we're testing against. So at some point in the paper or the presentation, we have to present sample mean, the population mean, population standard deviation. We have to report that at some point. But for our write-up, we would assume that those that information would have been presented in some matter, maybe earlier. So we can say for our write-up is goes to our conclusion. So our uh, acorns, where maybe our mean is equal to 15.8, and then we could say like n equals 25. And this is actually a bad way because we need a me measure of dispersion too. But we would say our acorns are smaller than, actually they're not equal, are not equal to the uh, our acorn length, the length of our acorns, that's where we're at. Our acorns is not equal to the length of the known species of oak. All right, so that part covers our conclusion or interpretation. No, we didn't say we reject our null hypothesis. Just get right to the conclusion, right to the interpretation, which was related to our question. Is our mean equal? Then we have to give what test we, we ran. So we ran a z-score test, is what we ran. And then I have a colon, and I report our p-value. And our p-value, 0 0.0001. Uh, R or down. And I put P in asterisk because when you knit it, 
asterisks give it an italics. Italicizes our cap p values capital. Now it depends on what journal you're publishing in. Some of them want the p values to be lowercase. Some of them want it lowercase italics. Some of them want uppercase. Some want uppercase italics. I just use the italics because that's what the journals that I would publish in require, or they ask us. So we give our p-value. Do we have a test statistic? No, not really. We don't have it. All right, but we get around it by reporting the mean. Do we have degrees of freedom? No. The normal curve is not defined by degrees of freedom. It's defined by our mean and standard deviation. So this satisfies our write-up. Questions? All right, so let's, let's move this over. We kind of went through and did it by hand, P norm. All right, z-score practice. We got two data sets. Sample of six crickets has a mean tarsus of 19.6. This particular species of cricket has a mean tarsus length of 17.9 and a standard deviation of 2.5. Does our sample belong to this species? All right. Male Western spotted skunks weigh about 535, uh, 535 grams. Standard deviation 105. He collected a male spotted skunk that weighs 635 grams. Is this individual larger than a Western spotted skunk? All right. So, what we'll do is you can work on this now. We got like seven minutes, eight minutes. Uh, you can work on this now, but what we'll do is on Wednesday we will pick up with this, and I'll show you my code along with my, the notes. So try to try to figure this out. Uh, you've got a difference basically. One's a sample, one's a single item. So kind of think about how that factors in. I'm just going to go ahead and. Practice. Practice problem. The first one was practice one. Uh, what was practice one? Crickets. And then our practice two. Let's get that going. Right. So you can work on this. Uh, for both of these, I want you to tell me the hypotheses that, that the question or that you're, you're testing. So null and alternate. Do the test to get your p-value and then have a write-up that follows our five requirements. 